Okay, can I have the picture up? Check this out. Check that out. Woo! Can you see that, Jesus? See that? It's, he's, he says this, beware of the counterfeit hippie Christianity. And then that counterfeit Christianity has, it's a hippie Christianity, also has a hippie Jesus that's made up. And we're going to talk about hippie Jesus today, the hippie Christianity and the real one. Okay? Cool? All right. Leave that up and we'll keep going today. So I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Um, yeah. It's very important because what's going on is so... In the Bible, it says narrow is the way to life. Narrow is the way of Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And literally said narrow is the way. Wide is the gate or the way that leads to destruction. And many go that way. Okay? So what's happened is different versions of Jesus have come into play. They had the same name. They would claim it's from the Bible, all that. But then... They, they walk away from the boundaries of the Word of God that Jesus and the Bible has set. And they say it's okay because God is love, Jesus is loving. They'll say things like this and then walk away from, they go wide. They, so people say, you know, be open-minded. Don't be so open-minded that your mind falls out of your head. Narrow is the way. I was open-minded and completely deceived. Before I came to Jesus, I was very open-minded, so open-minded, I got so completely deceived away from God into the worst things. And then Jesus came and set me free. Hippie Christianity has created a counterfeit hippie Jesus that never corrects, never rebukes, never speaks harshly. Maybe not never, sometimes, but I wrote never. Never speaks harshly, always smiles, never speaks nor stands against injustice. Never calls for repentance, never speaks about how, is tolerant of all things, doesn't require you to change, etc. Hippie Christianity, hippie Christianity says unbiblical things like, Jesus loves you just the way you are. Who has heard that before? Jesus loves you just the way you are. Yeah? Is that a true statement? Let's look. It sounds like it is. But let's look. Yes, Jesus loves you, but not just the way you are. That's why he said that we need to repent. If he loved me just the way I am, I wouldn't, he wouldn't be telling me to change. He loves me just the way I am. He loves me, but he doesn't like who I've become, so he, I need to change. Yes, Jesus loves you, but not just the way you are. That's why he said that we need to repent. We need to deny ourselves take up our cross and follow him. We need to die from who we were and be born again, a new creation. The old things need to pass away and all things become new in Christ Jesus. Why would he be saying this? Scripture after scripture I can bring you where he says this stuff. Repent. Put away those things. If you, if you sow into your sinful nature, you reap destruction. Because he wants us to change. He doesn't want us just the way we are. He loves you. All right, your little personality, your humor that you might have, he made you that way. But he doesn't love the garbage that has come with it. And he wants us to change. That's why we all need to repent to come to Jesus. The dangerous result of hippie Christianity, some of them, are these. Gay Christians. It has become a massive thing now. For Christians, they say they were born gay, which there's no such thing to be born gay, guys. They're just deceived. When I'm speaking like this, I'm not against the person. I'm against the lies. And just because it's, it's um, the fashionable thing to not speak against this stuff, it doesn't mean it's fashionable with God. God still says to speak the truth in love. So what has happened now, there's gay ministers, lesbian ministers. And we're talking about, they say they're pastors. They're leading churches. They have churches full of gay, homosexual people, lesbian people, LGBTQ, X, Y, Z, T. I don't know how much initials they'll keep making. To cater for these people. Why? Because God loves you. It's hippie Christianity. It's Christianity that just accepts everything. And if you don't accept it, then you're judgmental and a bigot and critical and all that kind of stuff. Jesus is judgmental. I want to be like my Lord. 
You know, he says in the Bible, people say, Jesus said, don't judge. No. He doesn't just say, don't judge, because you know what he explains himself about when he says that? Don't judge in the flesh. In other words, when the word judge there, it means condemn. To condemn someone means to judge them without hope. So if I say to someone, and they're still alive, they still have a breathing, they're still breathing, and I say to them, you're going to hell for sure no matter what, I just judge them without hope. That means condemnation. I've ended their life, their hope, and even God's still giving them life, so I'm not allowed to do that. Christians should never condemn, but we are allowed to judge. Go for it. The word judge, we say that don't judge, you are judging the person by judging. You get yeah, when you tell them don't judge, you're actually doing the same thing. Yes, yes, exactly. You're judging what they would say. Yes. See, it's every, everything that the world throws at you to shut you up, what Satan uses, is literally so hypocritical, it's crazy. If you say, listen, God loves you as a person. He wants, to, he wants you to know who you really are, who he made you to be. You're not gay. You got deceived into that lifestyle. You're not a lesbian. You got deceived into that lifestyle. They'll say, oh, you're a bigot. You're a judgmental bigot. Do you know what bigot means? Someone that is intolerant of someone else's belief. I said something and they'll say to me, you're a bigot. So what are they being right now? For them to say this, what do they have to be? A bigot. They have to be intolerant of what I'm saying. So they're calling me a name that they themselves are doing themselves. You see the hypocrisy in every area of what they say? It's complete hypocrisy because it's silly. It's foolishness. What they've been deceived by the enemy to... to and I, I, I am sad for them. When I speak like this, I'm sad for those who are walking in homosexuality, and lesbianism, in confused identity. Now you can't say mother or father. You've got to say parents because it's offensive all this crazy stuff and we keep giving into craziness no sorry i have a mind and that's crazy and i'm not going to keep giving into your craziness leaving you in your craziness i have to tell you look that's crazy you need help in a good way you really need help just like a drug addict needs help you have mentally something that you're thinking the way you're thinking you need help and I've said this before, we've let this go so far that kids now are saying that they're a boy trapped in a girl's body or a girl trapped in a boy's body. Six years old, seven years old, talking like this, and they want us to condone that as parents. You accept that? No. I'm not going to harm my child. I'm not going to go along with this lie that's from the devil, taking, stealing, killing, and destroying that child's future because you want me to go along with it because it's politically correct. No. Call me whatever name you want. And you should be the same. As Christians, the Bible says it's the truth that will make you free. The truth. So we have to learn to say the truth in love. Um, I'll continue. See, stories keep coming to my head, but then I'll go really long if I keep saying every story that comes in my head. Things that happen. So the danger... The dangerous result of hippie Christianity, some of the dangerous results, is homosexual Christians, like I said before, claiming God is okay with homosexuality, LGBTQ, all that stuff. Uh, it's, it's okay. Again, another one is living together as Christians. So uh, uh, even if they're engaged, um, or boyfriend and girlfriend Christians, living together saying it's okay. It's not okay. He says in the Bible, when... This is when a, a man goes to his wife, they cling together to become husband and wife. He says, when, this is when they leave their mother and father to cling to his wife. A man leaves his mother and father to cling to his wife. Okay? You're not meant to do it like the world where you test things out. Try it out before I get married, see if it works. What do you think? It's a car? It's, it's a living person you're partnered up with. Not a car. You try out. But the world's way is try out the car first. Try out the woman. Have sex together. Try out the man. Do all the stuff first and see if you guys are capable. Okay. What? Garbage. Ways of the world. Don't fall for it. It's not okay. God hasn't changed. The world keeps changing and telling us God has to change with it. No. I am the Lord God, he says. I change not. In the Bible, he says... He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. For how long? Forever. The world is changing. Fashion is changing. 
People are acting differently, weird things, new things are happening, new technology, some good things, some bad things. But God does not change. Because he's not talking about clothing or colors on your clothes or before they used to wear these robe dresses even men and now we wear pants and t-shirts and stuff. That's okay. He's not talking about that. He's talking about his character, his holiness, his ways. Uh, so again, living together as Christians, a man and a woman living together, boyfriend and girlfriend or engaged is not okay. He says to be married. Living unrepented worldly sinful lifestyles and believing it's okay with God. Willingness to be selective about what they want to accept from the Bible and what they don't like, they reject. That's what they do. Uh, you know, I, I've met people where they didn't want to accept hell. I don't believe that hell exists. I don't believe in hell, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they believe in God exists, right? They know the Bible talks about hell, but they'll say, I don't believe that that is real place. Why would God do that? So because he, they don't fathom that idea because of the, the thought of it, it scares them so much that they reject what God said. Well, if you're going to reject parts of the Bible, you're rejecting the Bible. It's a very dangerous slope to go to. And I've seen many people slip away into false Christianity because of that. Because they won't keep the book, the Holy Bible, as their boundary. As what keeps them. It, you know, there's things that I read in the Bible that I myself go, wow. God, really? You would do that? Or you're like this or you're like that? It's there, but I either am going to go after him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, or I'm going to reject him. I'm not going to pick and choose out of his book. I don't like that, so, and then make my own God in my own image and likeness, the way I want him to be. That's idolatry. And then call him the same name, act like he's from the same Bible. That's what idolatry is, making a false God, even if you call him Jesus. Making a false God because you're rejecting some of his ways because it's ways that you don't want. And that's what the homosexual Christian movement has done. They're saying God is okay. Why? Because God made me, right? Yes, he did. So if he made me and I love men as a man, I love men, then God made me that way. I was born this way. See how the mentality is? No, 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 no. The reason why God says you must be born again is because he didn't make you that way. Everyone is born into corruption. Wrong mindsets, wrong thinking. It might be your deception that you have. It might be uh, sexual stuff, like always wanting to have sex with different women. Uh, another man, another woman, the same thing with other men. It doesn't have to be homosexuality. They also have to be born again. Now, if someone is a liar, someone's a murderer, someone's a rapist, they all have to be born again. Whatever deceit has come into their heart and whatever they're participating in, in other words, the deceit is there, the lie, they accept it and they start doing the act of sin. No matter what it is, it's still wrong. Just as much as a homosexual one is wrong, so is the murder, so is the stealing, so is the lying. Everyone needs to be born again. So when people say, I was born this way, yes, that's why Jesus said you must be born again. Yes, you were born a sinner. You need to be born again. Amen. Yes, you were born a sinner. You need to be born again. That's what in John chapter 3 says, and unless you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, how can I go back into my mother's womb and come back out again now that I'm old? He goes, unless you're born of water and of the Spirit, which is to be baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you cannot mm -hmm. enter the kingdom of God. We all need to be born again. So whoever says they were born that way, yes, they were. That's why they need to repent and be born again. All of us did and do. So let me continue. <clears throat> it's very dangerous, this uh, hippie Christianity. Because he, he sounds very loving. Because look how awesome he looks. Like, yeah, what's up? Look at him. You know, he's blinging, nice colors. Looks so welcoming and inviting. Who wouldn't want hippie Jesus? But is that how he really was? Was he just that way? That's what we got to understand. It's so dangerous when we have an image of who the Lord and what the Lord is like, and we reject the other side of who he is, then when he wants to speak that way to you, like a strong way, a rebuke way, if you don't accept him that way, you will reject him when he does. You, you just only accept the false... Hippie Jesus version. 
in Christianity, now I understand that it is like people who believe in God in Jesus, yeah, but the freedom, for example, how they don't understand it is not the God is freedom, it's the world is freedom. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's the freedom to choose what is right. You're not a robot. He's given us freedom to see what the truth. He set us free from the bondage of the lie of the enemy. And then to be free to choose his ways or to reject them. Not to be free to go and have sex before marriage, lie, steal, do everything you were doing before accepting Jesus. And the difference is, but yeah, I've accepted Jesus. Yeah, I believe in Jesus now. So does the devil. The devil also believes in Jesus. He just won't change. So what's the difference? The same. Walking like the devil, saying we believe in Jesus, but will not change. Jesus said at one stage, your father is the devil, and the works of your father you do from the beginning. Why? Because the way they were living was not. This was talking to Pharisees. He's talking to believers. Back then, believers, he turns around saying, our father, and they're claiming that God is the original, and they follow the ways of Abraham, and he says, your father's the devil. And it's his ways, your, his works you're doing. That's who you belong to. But they thought they believed that they belonged to God. It matters. But let's continue and watch this unfold. This is not to go, oh, what are you talking about? You need to see this, otherwise you're going to go into a new age, hippie Jesus. Where you can mix the things of the new age, things of stuff that is of the devil, things that were authored from the devil, you'll mix them with your belief in Jesus and think it's okay. But God says, no, I'm a jealous God. I don't want you playing with that stuff and this stuff. Be all mine. You are mine. If you're going to be mine, be mine. It's just like, and you can say, wow, that's a bit harsh. But let me ask you something. If you are about to get married, think back. If you are married, think back before you got married and you're about to get married to your wife or to your husband, your new husband. And they also, they, the wife tells you, I love you, thank you, I believe in you, I accept you as my husband, but I also want to go a little bit to the other guy next door every now and then. I want to have a little bit of fun with him too. And the other guy in the supermarket, I really like him. And there's another guy that wears a uniform, he's really cute. I want to just go with him a little bit too, but I love you. You wouldn't accept this wife, would you? What about your husband? Saying to you, yes, honey. I love you, you have all my heart, I love you, you are mine, I am yours, I believe in you, I want to live for you, I want to accept you as my wife and saviour. <laughs> um, and then you go on, and you, but, but listen, I'm going to go and just be with these other girls, I saw some cute ones over there, another one over there, another, this, uh, would you as a wife be okay with that? No, right? In the same way, this is how you see Jesus. He's not okay with us with him being shared with others. If he's your Lord and Savior, let him be your Lord and Savior. If he's your first love, let him not have a, a shared one. Let him be your first love. Amen. Let's continue. Watch this unfold. This will freak out some people. When I start showing you how Jesus also was, because remember, especially the modern version, the, you know, I'll say it differently, the popular version of Christianity has really tamed Jesus down. Not everywhere, but the majority places, they have tamed Jesus down as this hippie, oh, it's okay, everything's okay, kind of Jesus. But let's look at some of the things he said or done, and I will encourage you at the end, I'm going to tell you what you can do to help you be set free from the wrong mindset. Um, so again, I'm going to just really repeat this real quick. Gay Christian, sorry, dangerous result of hippie Christianity or false Christianity believes that gay Christians is okay. It's okay to be gay and Christian or lesbian and Christian or whatever. Uh, claiming God is okay with that. Living together as Christians is okay. A like boy and girl living together before they get married is not okay, but they think it's okay. Living unrepented, worldly, sinful lifestyles and believing it's okay with God, it's not okay, but they believe it's okay. Willingness to be selective about what they want to accept from the Bible and what they don't want to accept. Again, that is hippie Christianity. The new age, fluffy Christianity that is not the Christianity of the Bible. It makes Jesus in their own image. A Jesus that suits and agrees and accepts what they believe, what they want to think, what they want to do. So basically, they are Lord. It's not Jesus. They are Lord. Because if he's Lord, which means boss, that means you will bow your knee when you're conflicting in your heart 
whether to do that thing you really wanted to do, but you know God is saying, don't do it. In the Bible, it's very clear, don't do such a thing. That you, if he's really your boss, your Lord, you will bow down to his will instead of yours. I'm not saying when you're struggling, when you know and you're struggling with sin. I'm saying when you actually go, nah, God's okay with this because God is love. You're actually rejecting what the Bible clearly says is not okay because you're, it doesn't suit what you really want to do. I'll say the last bit. Makes Jesus in their own image a Jesus that suits, agrees, and accepts what they, they want and think. It's a corrupt version. They use a corrupt version of God's love and grace. R listen to this scripture. They use a corrupt version. What goes with this? It's a corrupt, a faker, a counterfeit version of the love of God and the grace of God. So I'll read you something that destroys that lie. They'll see that grace is a permission to sin and get away with it. Basically, I can do whatever. I'm in his grace. He paid for it. It wasn't by anything I did. It wasn't by my works or I can do to get saved. He done it for me, so I don't have to do anything. No, you need to repent. It's always a lifestyle like that. So they use the grace of God um, as the ability to sin and get away with it, that we're in grace. But grace was not given to us by God so we can be free to sin. Grace was given us to God by God so we can be free from sin. Yes. Grace was given to us by God so it empowers us to walk in freedom from sin. That's what it does to us. You're, you can, because with God all things are possible. Listen to this scripture. Jude chapter 1 verse 3 to 7 says this. Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. He's talking to Christians, okay? But now I find that I must write about something else, I, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. He has to remind them of something. He heard some stuff about these Christians. He had to go, hey, I have to remind you of what Christianity is like, our faith is like. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their ways into your churches saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ, which means they denied His ways. That's what that means. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later He destroyed those who did not remain faithful. Did you hear what he just said? Who did that? Jesus. Did you hear what the scripture just said? He's talking to Christians and he's saying, hey, don't use your grace and corrupt it in thinking that you can live wrong now because of grace. Because I'm going to remind you of something. Even though Jesus set free the nation of Israel from the Egyptians when they were under the Pharaoh, he goes afterwards destroyed them. Who did it? Who did it according to scripture? Jesus. Let me continue. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels. Listen to how far he's going to go. Are the angels believers or not? They're angels. He says, and I, and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of the authority of God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. They went past the boundaries that God said, don't do this. What happened? God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for that great day of judgment. And don't forget of Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Homosexuality. Lesbianism, LGBTQ. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. This is in the New Testament. This was a letter to the church because he saw them, hey, you guys are getting a bit fluffy. Hippie Jesus, hippie Christianity, the false hippie Jesus and false Christianity was starting to come up even from back then. And they had to warn them, hey, God hasn't changed. Do you know what God's grace is? I told you, it's the empowerment to help you walk free from sin. 
But another thing it is, is time. God's grace is time. He gives us time to be transformed by Him. The way we transform is we bow and say yes to Him. Transform me, Lord. If you stuff up, you get back up and you say, Lord, transform me, Lord. Change me. I don't want those ways. Because you'll be fighting in yourself because you still have the flesh on you. The flesh is going to want what is against God, what is against His ways. And God knows that. He understands that. Jesus felt, I lived this out. He went through this where His flesh was pulling Him. He says in the Bible that He was tempted in every way, but He didn't sin. So He can be a compassionate high priest. Because he understands what you feel like when you're looking at a girl and he starts going to a place where it's not right. Or a girl looking at a guy and it's going to a place in your mind where you shouldn't go. He understands all these feelings, but he never gave in to them. But he knows how to help you because he felt them as a man, as a human. He's an amazing high priest who understands what he feels like. That's why he says, come to me. Come to me. Don't run from me. Don't make excuses. Come to me. I'll help you in your time of trouble, in your time of need. I'll help you. He knows what it feels like. He wanted to feel what it feels like so he can be like this for us. What an amazing Lord. Love corrects, love protects, love wants to warn you of danger. That's true love of God. It's not, ah, oh, God loves me so I can do anything I want because God loves. God is also just, God is also holy. God is also righteous. He's not just love. But let's read this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 to 13. Leave it. Because I'm using the NLT version. Uh, it'll confuse you as, as he puts up the King James. So that's why. Hebrews 12, verse 5 to 13. I just, it says the same thing. I just loved how much more simply it explained it. I looked it up already, so that's why. Have you forgotten the encouragement the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children. He said, my child, don't make light of the, of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up. Listen to how God loves you. Okay? Listen. The Bible. New Testament to Christians. The book of Hebrews. It says, my child, don't make light the Lord's discipline. Don't think it's a light thing. Don't give up when he corrects you. If it's so gentle, why would you want to give up? So it's not so gentle when he's correcting you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. So remember, when you're saying, God, I love you. Do you love me? He loves you and you're going to see some discipline. Are you okay with that? Do you know why I'm saying this? If you're not okay with that, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to make a fluffy hippie Jesus in your mind that doesn't do that. But he does. God loves you, so he disciplines those he loves. And he continues to make sure that you understand this is not a, a nice thing that he's saying. The Lord, uh, Lord discipline. Sorry. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you, for the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Let that sink in for a second. If that's making you go, oh, whoa, you, you had a fluffy Jesus in your head. That's good what's happening. If you're going, oh, it's good. You need to see him for who he is. Because he'll never chastise you. He'll never correct you. He'll never be stern with you if he didn't care about you. If it wasn't for your good and you were going the wrong way, you were going towards danger. That's why. He loves you and he does that. And a loving father would do that. He doesn't just come up to you harshly. He knows how to deal with you at the right time for the way you've been responding in your life. If he needs to get severe and serious with you, he'll get serious with you. But do you know that I completely changed and became the way I am with God, like serious to follow him out of his love. He never once told me off in a harsh way. Even when he was showing me that my lifestyle was taking me to hell. He did it with so much love. He was breaking me because I was thinking he would have told me off. That he would be, you know, like making me feel condemned and harsh inside the emotions that would come on me because of the way I'm living. But he was doing it with so much love. He was breaking me. I'm thinking, why would you be good to me? Why are you speaking to me with kindness when I deserve for you to yell at me, to rebuke me, 
to beat me up something and he wouldn't so i'm telling you you can trust him so much you don't be scared of that when it's time that he's severely going to say something strong to you it's because you've gone very deep and very far and he tried so many times and you won't listen and it'll sound harsh it'll react the way he thinks is best to react he's god we are not god but you need to see this part of him because we don't like talking about it we don't so therefore if he ever does it i don't think that was god but god loves you he will do it when it's right to do it and he knows when it's best but let me continue because we have a bit to go um my child uh, he, he punishes or chastises whips each one that he accepts as his child At, as you endure this divine discipline remember that god is treating you as his own children you want to be treated like his own children right there you go whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father if god doesn't discipline you as his as he does all the other children it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all in other words if as a father he doesn't care enough to come at you to correct you when you've been going the wrong way then he's not a father because what father a good father wouldn't go and try to help his child even if he has to be stern and correct them chastise them whatever needs to happen because of their lifestyle listen to how he says it since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits god and live forever for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years doing the best they knew how but god disciplines us always for our good listen to why he disciplines us it's for our good so that we might share in his holiness listen to this next bit no discipline is enjoyable while it is happening it's painful but afterward there will be peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way so take a new grip with your tired hands strengthen your weak knees mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and are lame will not fall but become strong so when you're being disciplined don't go oh, walk away have you seen those children where they've been told off and then, they walk away don't be like that go thank you dad don't be like those kids <laughs> we're just big kids doing the same stuff the hippie christianity would have told jesus listen to this ready let me read you something first john chapter 2 verse 13 to 16 says this now the passover of the jews was at hand and jesus say jesus, jesus. so jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business they were doing money exchange when he had made a whip this is Jesus he made a whip of cords he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen poured out the changes money overturned the tables who did that not hippie Jesus hippie Jesus would never do that that's because he's made up in your imagination the real Jesus did do these things can you imagine someone just went now to some <laughs> anyway you know when I was young I, was, I nearly did it at an Orthodox Church I really did I was getting angry because I just saw the video of Jesus you know how the one that played on Easter <laughs> And I saw how they were flipping tables and he's like, like, yeah, they're doing the same thing. They're selling stuff. Now, listen, this building is not a church building. You are the church. You are the temple of God. Okay. Everything's changed. So just understand that in that area. So let me read, continue. Uh, it says, um, now the Passover drove and he whipped, sorry. And he made a whip of cords, drove them all out the temple with sheep and the oxen and poured out the money, the changes of money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. This he, this his disciples remember that it was written, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. So I write this. Hebrew Christianity would have told Jesus after he finished flipping the tables over 
and throwing people out of the temple for doing business there, that he wasn't being very Christ-like. They would have literally went up to Jesus, if he wasn't Jesus, if it was just another Christian doing exactly what Jesus did and he was meant to do because he only did and said what he saw the Father saying and doing, they would have walked up to Jesus and said, Jesus, come on, that's not very Christ-like. You have to be more like a Christian. They would have told him that he needs to be more loving and compassionate with people because they're just trying to make a living to feed their families. Sounds nice, right? Sounds, yeah, that's true. They would have booked him in for a counseling session explaining to him that we as Christians are to build up people and not tear them down. This is what hippie Christianity sounds like. It sounds very loving and wow, but it's not the true Christianity. I'm not saying you don't do that in some cases, by the way. Don't, I'm not going to extreme that side. I'm saying you need to be open to understand he wasn't just always going, oh, let the children come to me. Oh, don't forbid this one. I love you. And he, did, he wasn't just doing that side. Of course he was, but he also had this other side of him. You see, hippie Christianity sounds loving and compassionate, just like Judas, who betrayed him, sounded when he said that the expensive perfume that was emptied on Jesus could have been sold and the money given to the poor instead of being all emptied and wasted on Jesus. Doesn't that sound nice as well? Judas, this woman comes in, she pours out this very expensive perfume and starts pouring it all over him. And it was beautiful what she did. And Judas says, this perfume is wasted. It could have been sold and given the money given to the poor. Doesn't that sound so true? Of course, that's a good point. But it wasn't what Jesus wanted at that moment. It wasn't what God and Jesus were thinking was right at that time. But again, like I said, some Christianity will sound like that. When you're doing some choices that might be like, oh, that is not right. We have to know the lamb and the lion. Jesus said, I'm the lamb. All right, that came to take away the sins of the world. He was going to give his life for everybody. But he was also the lion from the tribe of Judah. When he comes, he says he's going to come back with a rod of iron to bring the wrath of God upon those who lived wickedly. The disobedient. This is the same Jesus is coming that way. He's fierce. You need to know him that way. So when you're standing against the devil and he's trying to attack you, you know who the one who's greater is in you is fierce. He's not just hippie. Oh, dude, we don't make war, man. It's love, peace. We have to behold, this is in the Bible, the goodness and severity of God. In Romans chapter 11, verse 21 to 22, it says this, For if God did not spare the natural branches, he's talking about the Jews. This is the book of Romans where everyone uses for the fluffy stuff. The same book says this, If God didn't spare the branches, the original branches, which were the Jews, because of their unbelief, because they're not walking faithfully with God, he broke them off and he put you on instead because you believed and want to walk faithful. He says this, he may not spare you either. He says this to Christians. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. This is how we have to understand. We have to understand his both sides. On those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. To Christians. There goes the passage when people say a false teaching. They say, once you're saved, you're always saved. That's not true. It's a fake, demonic teaching. That did not come from God. It's, they say you can't lose your salvation. Yes, I didn't lose my keys. It's not lose, but you can choose to forsake it. Willingly, knowingly. It is biblical that people can choose to walk away. And they, people, this teaching then has to bring commentary that doesn't exist. I'll say things like, when they were never really Christians, how do you know? Because they would never have done that. Man, the prodigal son walked away, even though he was with the father and he was a son. Willingly and knowingly, what are you talking about? He was never really a son. That's not what the Bible says. He was really a son. But he chose to walk away. And the father says he was dead when he walked away. And he became alive again when he came back. It says in the Bible that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Okay? Sometimes truth doesn't sound very ear tickling. But it's the truth. And the truth makes us free. 
Um, there was this book that I tell you all the time that I love reading. Nearly every year I will read it. Because it really has blessed me. And every year, depends where I am at with God, it's God uses it to speak to me in different angles. God has touched different places, different books. He's ordained some people to write some things like their testimony and encounter they had with God, which has been a blessing to the body of Christ. I don't elevate it above the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word of God. Okay, no book, other book is. But it's, there's books that are a blessing. Like there's a few things from different authors that have been really cool for Christians and it's really helped them grow. Um, and in this book, there's a section where it's talking about this army of God raising up and how there was many Christians that were also across from the field and they, they had demons riding them like horses. And the reason why the demons were riding the Christians like horses was because the Christian was agreeing with the demon that was riding them. So if the demon was a demon of jealousy and the Christian also was jealous of other people, then he was in agreement so he had a right to ride them. All he had to do to get rid of the demon was to, re, to not agree with the demon, not agree with being jealous and envious of your brother or sister, but instead bless them. Praise God for their growth and their good things that are coming their way, their blessings. Not be jealous and envious of them. So this is how it was. And so there was another section. He saw different groups that were being deceived as Christians. And I'm going to read you one of the hippie ones, hippie group that existed even in this book. You ready? That he sees. He says, Then the voice of the Lord came to me saying, This is the beginning of the enemy's last day army. So he's showing him the future. He's showing this attack that Satan's doing on the church. And he says, This is the beginning of it, of the last day army of Satan. This Satan's ultimate deception. And his ultimate power of destruction is released when he uses Christians to attack each other. Christians attacking Christians. Throughout the ages, he has used this army, but never has he been able to capture so many to be used for his evil purposes. Do not fear. I have an army too, Jesus said to him. You must now stand and fight because there is no longer any place to hide for, from this war. Listen, I'm not saying this is the last, last day at all. Like the end, Jesus is coming now or something. But there's something going on. Something evil is moving around the world and its fruit is to steal, to oppress, to kill, to destroy. People are committing suicide. There's more deaths of suicide in Australia than COVID deaths. And they're still locking them down. More than ever. Can you believe that? The deaths since the lockdowns were more higher than any COVID death and they still think that it's helping the people by keeping them locked up. Teenagers killing themselves, committing suicide because they're getting so depressed and mentally into themselves so they end up taking their life. Husbands, wives, crazy stuff going on. Nothing on the news but saying things like this. There's six more cases today, 500 more cases. Did they do that three years ago when people were still having 300 cases of the flu? that week, or 400 cases of pneumonia, or 600 cases of cancer that week? Were they announcing it on the TV every moment? No. Why are they doing it so much? It keeps fear. It keeps you focused on the covered, covered, covered. Distraction. And closing their ears to the cry of those dying, hundreds of them, for things that are not sicknesses, they're committing suicide. So I'm saying to you, Satan has plotted something that has become so evident, so much he's taken an upper level like we've never seen before in our lifetime of a movement that happened since this pronunciation when they announced this thing that happened, pandemic. Something's been going on worldwide. It's spiritual first, what's going on. So this is the reason why I wanted to say this about this army and things like this. Do not fear, I have an army too. Please be part of it, guys. You must now stand and fight because there is no longer any place to hide from this war. You must fight for my kingdom, for truth, for those who have been deceived. I had been so repulsed and outraged by the evil army that I had wanted to die rather than live in such a world. This is what the guy that was going through this vision, he says, I, didn't want, I wanted to die then go through this. He was repulsed by what was happening. However, this word from the Lord was so encouraging that I immediately began yelling to the Christian prisoners that they were being deceived. Thinking that, listen to this, 
He's yelling at the Christian prisoners, telling them that they've been deceived, thinking that they will listen to him, to me, he said. When I did this, it seemed that the whole army turned to look at me, but I kept yelling. I thought that the Christians were going to wake up and realize what was happening to them. But instead, many of them started reaching for their arrows to shoot at me. He's yelling, telling them the truth. These Christians wanted to shoot at him. The others just hesitated as if they did not know what to make of me. I knew then that I had done the, this prematurely and that it had been a very foolish mistake. The battle begins, then I turned and saw the army of the Lord standing behind me. Listen to this bit now. There was thousands of soldiers. Now he's talking about the army of the Lord. But we were still greatly outnumbered. Only a small number were fully dressed in their armor, so that most were only partially protected. A large number were already wounded. Most of those who had all of their armor still had very small shields, which I knew would not protect them from the onslaught that was coming. The majority of these soldiers were women and children. Behind this army, there was a trailing mob similar to the prisoners. They were not prisoners, but they were similar. Listen to these this ones now. Behind this Christian army was this mob who followed the evil army, but very different in nature. These seemed to be very happy people and were playing games singing songs, feasting and roaming about from one little camp to the next. It reminded me of the atmosphere of Woodstock. It was like a hippie movement, Woodstock. They're going and sitting in the fields, music is happening, they're getting high, marijuana. I tried to raise my voice above the clamor to warn them that it was not the time for this, that a battle was about to begin, but only a few could ever, could even hear my voice. Those who did gave me the peace sign, He's telling the Christians, hey, there's war. You have to get up and fight. You have to stand. Worshipping, this is how I fight my battles. It looks like I'm surrounded because you are. I'm surrounded by you. Peace, dude. No, man. Get up and fight. People keep talking about this where they went around the, the Jericho, the walls of Jericho, right? They didn't fight. They went around these walls of Jericho that was keeping them from going into the fight. The story doesn't finish with them just walking around the walls and yelling and then the walls fell down. That did happen. It was supernatural. It finishes with this. Then they ran in and took them down. They actually still fought. They still went in and fought the battle. The supernatural that they couldn't do came down by God. And then he wanted them to still go in and take down that ground. But we make songs like, this is how I fight my battles. I like it. But it's not, what it's claiming is not the Bible. So you just sit back, God fights your battles. He goes before you, he says in the Bible. But look at the context of what goes before you looks like. You look at the Bible. When God went before them, they were still also going. God was also going before them and fighting for them. But they were still going after the Lord and also fighting. They didn't just sit back going, oh, God's gone before us. Catch you later. This is how I fight my battles. I tried to explain that the Lord, sorry, those who did, gave, who did hear me gave me the peace sign. Hippie Christians. And said they did not believe in war. And that the Lord would not let anything bad happen to them. I tried to explain that the Lord had given us armor for a reason. Not to look nice in armor. Look at this. I have armor. It's shining. It's because it's a fight. But they just re retorted that they had come to a place of peace and joy where nothing would happen to them. I began praying earnestly for the Lord to increase the faith shields of those with the armor to help us protect those who were not ready for the battle. The book keeps going. But this is what's happening. There's much Christianity around the world that have sat back. Ah, oh, I just found myself now. I'm just in peace and just singing while Satan's stealing, killing and destroying. And he needs his people to stand up, not just spiritually, but physically. I'm not saying with violence to stand up, make voice be heard. 
Use what you can to stand in the way of what Satan's doing also physically, deceiving people. Let me finish with this as before we do communion. What do we do? I want to encourage you to do something for me. It's up to you if you want to do it or not. This is my advice to you. If you've been going, I don't, understand, I don't know if I, I think some of the things you heard, because I can keep going about what Jesus said to some people and sounded very harsh. In fact, he called some people devils. He said, you whitewash tombs. You bunch of devils. This is Jesus talking like this. Of course, it's specific people that he will talk to like this because of their attitude. Okay? Don't get me wrong. But what do we do? The best thing I believe you should do is this. Choose to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even if you read one of them. The four Gospels in the beginning of the Bible, the New Testament, is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the repeated story from the angle of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What they saw Jesus saying, what they heard, and they recorded their version of it, their angle of it. Okay, So they differ a little bit in different areas. Some have more of the story, some less. I encourage you, read. Read the book of Matthew. Read Mark. Choose one. And read it now. Empty your cup and read and acknowledge how Jesus is speaking to every person. How he's reacting. Don't just put such a glasses of fluffiness that when you see him speaking harshly, you're like, no, no, that's not Jesus. And you kind of read that, but you're not really reading that. You're just skipping over it and we're going to the next bit that sounds really nice. Read him for who he is and then say to him, I want to know you completely. I want to know how you really are, Lord. Because there's people... We're coming to times, maybe, hopefully not, but maybe, where you'll need to speak strong and stand strong about what you believe. But if you think that Jesus never speaks strong, but always speaks fluffy and like this, oh no, like this, then you won't stand up and speak. They will say to you something like this, are you judging us? Doesn't Jesus say, do not judge and you shut up? Because like, he worked again. The famous line that they use on Christians. Jesus said, judge, righteous judgment. Okay? Do not condemn at any time, but judge, righteous judgment. I'm not going to walk past someone raping a, a lady. And then I'm going to walk past him. I'm going to, hey, because let's not be hypocrites then. If we're not going to judge, I shouldn't judge that guy. I'm not going to judge him. No, I'm going to judge him. I'm even going to pick him up and throw him out. Something for bringing harm to somebody. We are to judge. You judge all the time. But judge righteous judgment. What is right in God's eyes, you're allowed to judge. And you make decisions on that judgment. That's why he judged them, guys. We're meant to follow Jesus. He said, you whitewash tombs. Your father's the devil. That's judgmental. But he didn't drop them dead because he gave them hope to repent. So he didn't condemn them. He judged them. The whole point is that we need to know our Lord so well. In terms, It always comes back to that. Because Jesus said, I make them one as we are one, Father. God heard his prayer. So as we become one, we become one in reaction as well, in thought, because we think the way he thinks in situations, because we're so connected. Be close to God and do what God wants you to do at the right time. Do it, okay? Because it could be there's people that will be doing things in the flesh as Christians. They're not meant to say what they're saying. But there is Christians that are saying exactly what God wants them to say to speak up and say those things. So learn what God is saying and doing and then do it, okay? In the Lord. Let me just pray. Father, thank you so much, God, for your truth. Lord, I pray, teach us, Lord. I know I'm still learning this and we're all learning this, but I pray for those watching and those listening right now that we will learn, learn you as you truly are, know you as you truly are, the lion and the lamb, your grace and your truth your goodness and severity. In Jesus Christ's name, Lord God. Lord, if we have any misunderstanding of how you are, if we think too fluffy of you, too hippie of you, but you're not like that, only. Show us your fullness of who you are in Jesus' name. Show my brothers and sisters watching and those who are here the fullness of who you really are so we can know you completely, love you completely as you are. In Jesus Christ's name, Lord God. Thank you, Father. I pray for those who have made a false image and likeness of who you are in their minds and hearts, an idol of their own idolatry, 
I pray in Jesus' name, break it down, God. Those who are willing for that to be broken down, break it down, God, and let you reign, your truth, who you are, reign in their life. In Jesus Christ's name. Thank you, Father God. Amen.